This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, um, thanks very much. I want to start by saying thank you uh, to Emily for inviting me and to all of the organisers um, for such a great event. I have to say at the start that to some extent I'm not really a specialist in this area, but I am a dabbler and I'm interested in certain aspects of, I suppose, certainly Shakespeare, comedy, and the global, and I think there are some points of intersection that are hopefully relevant to some of the conversations that people have been having here already. Um, so I think one of the main reasons Emily asked me to be involved um, was because I was heavily involved in a project that had to do with, thank you, the 2012 World Shakespeare Festival, which um, included and was allied with the Globe to Globe Festival. Um, here in London, but also included productions here in London um, that were part of the greater festival that people might may or may not have realized, and things like The Rest of Silence, um, what else was here, Desdemona at the Barbican, the Nina Gawa performance of Cymbeline, things like that. Um, this project that I was involved in started in late 2011 um, with an uh, application to the AHRC um, to work within their connected communities uh, theme. So the title here is You, you See What We Propose to Them. Um, and what emerged from that was a website called The Year of Shakespeare that uh, aimed, and I would actually say also succeeded, in um, include documenting in a certain kind of way the entire festival, which in the end, by our count, included um, about 74 productions or uh, exhibitions um, with the, under the aegis of the Olympic celebrations. And for me, I won't go into this today, but crucially we're funded in a certain way by the Olympic celebrations. Um, this website is still up, although we're currently in the process of now doing a weird thing of kind of the opposite of digitizing it. We're undigitizing it um, to save it as um, uh, in the archives of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, who hold the RSC archives. Um, but that's a whole other story that I won't go into. It will stay online, but it's not being maintained in the same kind of way. But the idea of the website was that it would, in real time with the festival, which included several global comedies, um, would uh, have on the front page kind of navigation to different productions that, for practical purposes, were organized by continent. So you can see here North America and Africa. And then if you click through, it's probably hard to see, but there's sort of with each production, like the Venus and Adonis, um, there's a little picture, and to the right of that, a button that after the production had happened, um, and we had a reviewer go out and write a response to it, that little button would appear that said click and read the review. And the reviewers, some of them are in this room today, were um, a kind of collective of academics, but we also had um, very bloggers from other, from heritage industries, from wider audiences, so mostly academic, but there was um, an, an impetus to try to involve other points of view and professions. If you did click through to a review, what you would find is um, some kind of initial response, but this one's by Sonia Masai uh, to the King Lear at the Almeida. Um, and then, if things went according to the way we'd hoped they would, you might also see some responses from other people. Um, and this is just comments from readers, but we also had ways of attempting to collect responses through Twitter, um, through taking pieces from other reviews and bringing them together with a digital tool called Storify, um, and other things like that. We also had Vox Pop interviews um, with certain audience members at a certain set of productions. Um, so what it attempted to be was by no means a complete, but at least a, an attempt to start to create a kind of archive of reception to the festival. This project resulted in this book, uh, which Annette is so kindly mentioned already, um, and it is now about to result in this book, um, which should be coming out at the end of this year. So, A Year of Shakespeare came out last year in the summer, uh, kind of spring-summer, and it is a collection of 74, roughly 1,000 word essays on each of these productions. So, obviously, it's um, just a start in trying to bring together, uh, make visible this whole festival, but it's just one, in many cases, one person's response. In some cases, informed by some of the responses that were then posted online. I certainly revised my essays in light of the responses, but it really depended on the reviewer and what they wanted to do. Um, Shakespeare on the global stage is more, I suppose, what we might call a traditional academic collection, and that it's more along the lines of roughly 10 essays that are looking across productions, um, trying to create a more kind of analytic, discursive frame in which to put them thinking about things like the performance of nationhood, um, of cultural celebration, 
Um, it also includes interviews with some of the uh, creative practitioners involved. Um, and for my part, I was writing on uh, the last chapter on the vexed topic of legacy, um, which was a buzzword throughout 2012 in terms of the Olympics. So one of the things I say in that chapter on legacy is I talk about legacy as an idea, first and foremost, and how it's come to sort of function within the London Olympics, but also within the International Olympic Committee, the kinds of resonances it has. Um, and I was working with a particular historian of the Olympics who was talking about you know, legacy in English versus heritage in French, the two official languages of the IOC. Um, and it made me interested certainly in temporality, if we're thinking about inheritance and legacy as a past thing or a future thing or both at once, and also in its potential um, kind of in a metaphorical but sometimes also in a literal way its financial resonances. So legacies can also be bequeathed. Um, and in doing that I talked quite a lot about consolidating cultural capital, if we want to talk about that in the Olympics, and also about speculating on it. Um, and so in terms of consolidation, I talked about things like this, um, which is the opening ceremony, one of, one of the kind of initial moments of it. So uh, Wiggins ringing the Olympic bell that's inscribed with the tempest, being able to hear the idols full of noises. And I, I think I talked quite a bit about how Shakespeare was present in a lot of different ways in the Olympics. Um, sometimes not necessarily in an overt way, but nevertheless there. And that's something that Frank Hotra Boyce, who wrote the Olympic ceremony that we interviewed for the volume, he kind of described it in his own way as Shakespeare being ambient, being a kind of potential resource that's around, that's there, even if you're not necessarily overtly wanting to make it kind of a thing. Um, and you know, he pointed out that it kind of depends on how you read it, maybe you read too much into it. Um, but certainly, <laughs> and there's plenty of people in our book reading a lot into it, myself included, um, there's certainly moments where Shakespeare becomes very focused in this ceremony, uh, most famously, not long after the ringing of the bell and Kenneth Branagh's recitation of Caliban's speech from the Tempest. Um, and we might think of the, the use of that speech as an emphasis on the lyrical, magical, mask-like state of this island, an island tale that's going to be told perhaps about Britain throughout the Olympics. Um, but also I think it's, in, so in some ways it kind of turns away from a potential kind of heavily post-colonial reading that we might associate with that play. But I think in some ways as well, this performance also retained that, perhaps in less overt ways, in the sense of kind of questions about industry and about the kind of the, the governance, but also financial development of a country being very present in it, in this case through the kind of narrative of the Industrial Revolution, um, but also in the way that the, the, the ceremony was conceived and also presented. So in terms of casting, it was very overtly colorblind in casting. Oh, and this one moves. Um, so this is some of the industrialists in their dancing. And famously, it was composed of a large group of volunteers, um, which is interesting in its own right. Um, but this emphasis on um, kind of intercultural multiculturalism um, or globalism, whatever word we want to use, and I know they do have different resonances and significances, was, I think, an important part not just of the Olympics in, in this moment, in the ceremony, but also if you look at the Olympic documents, the bid for the Olympics in 2004 to 5, an important way in which they were being conceived in terms of how they want to tell the story of what England is now, or I should say the UK. Um, and also, I think what I want to go on to talk about in the rest of this talk is also how the Shakespeare aspects of the Olympics in some ways followed suit. Um, so in response, there's lots of different responses to this ceremony. There's quite a few on the New York Shakespeare website, quite a lot of tweets that we collected. Um, but one relatively, uh, at least in the moment, famous one was this one, um, which was uh, Aidan Burley, who tweeted a few different things about the ceremony, but certainly called it multicultural crap. So at least the multicultural message was received, um, <laughs> if not appreciated. Um, I think I'll leave that there. Can I just come back to it? Because I do want to get to the overt sort of Shakespearean performances. But I wanted to highlight the fact that that multiculturalism, obviously, I think as many people know and perhaps were a part of, was also very much on display in the kind of more overt Shakespeare programming that was funded at least in part by the Olympics. Um, the Olympic funding was at least the sort of impetus to it, if, as is often the case, the institutions then had to go out and find quite a lot of their own funding to carry it through. So we might talk about moving from ambient Shakespeare to maybe a more explicit, prominent Shakespeare. Um, and in my chapter when I'm talking about legacy, I talk about going from maybe consolidating Shakespeare to also speculating. And one of the points I make is that capital isn't increased. You kind of save your wealth through consolidation, but you don't create new wealth unless you speculate. Um, and actually, it was very 
lovely for many reasons to be on the same panel as Eleanor, but not least because I cite her in the discussion of that because she wrote a piece on the Complete Works Festival at the RSC in 2006 to 7, um, talking about the foreign language productions that were a part of that, and maybe pointing out the fact that although they were valued in their own way, they didn't necessarily create the same kind of, didn't necessarily create as big of a presence as maybe some people would hope for. So one of the questions that I was interested in thinking about in my chapter is what was it about the particular context of this year that perhaps made that uh, speculation on what we might call global Shakespeare pay off. We might also ask if it did pay off, um, but I'll leave that for now. Um, so what I'd like to do is, I was thinking about, okay, what can I say specifically about comedy, trying to bring these different productions together, because a lot of what I focus on has actually been more on the administration, the governance, the funding, um, the kind of cultural studies aspects of it. Um, but it was actually a really nice exercise to sit back and go through the productions. I did not see all of them. I did read about all of them because I fully edited the entire site um, and also the book with my co-editors. Um, but I was thinking about, first of all, the comedies that I'd read about and then also the ones that I had seen in some way. And I realized that in one way or another, I think I saw about a third of the sort of 70 or so productions, 75 productions that were on offer. Um, and I'm going to say a few very general things about comedy in the festival. Um, really just as kind of some reflections, but I recognize the fact that this is very much just a kind of initial thought. And then I'm going to move on to the, the last part of the paper, which is about where does this go next, and specifically talking about my interest in digital Shakespeare. Um, so what can we say about comedy in the festivals? Well, I kind of have three main things that I wanted to bring up that no doubt other people can talk about in much more detail, but just as a kind of reflective account. Obviously, I think any shake performance is almost always political in some way, and I suppose perhaps there might be a perception that global performance perhaps brings with it a kind of political impetus that might even be stronger. Um, I picked, I think all of the pictures I have up here, except for one or two, are productions that I saw, so that was sort of the limiting factor I was using. Um, but I think it was interesting in that some productions were political just in, in and of the, the fact that they were being performed. So I might, for instance, put um, the Comedy of Errors up here, the Afghan Comedy of Errors, and the South Sudanese Cymbeline in that category of, uh, certainly the Cymbeline wasn't necessarily, it, there were moments that might be read as political, but maybe not in the ways that audiences might have been expecting. But the production itself, in its coming, the way that it was received, even before it came, the way it was received in the media, I think was a political event. Um, we might also have other moments, I mean, Richard II down here in the bottom is not technically a comedy, um, although it was interesting what they did with the comic moment of the, sort of the garden scene, which I would say was perhaps more comic than what I've typically seen in other productions of that play. But there was an explicit bringing on of flags in one moment. And then interestingly, up at the top, um, the comedy of airs that was at the RSC in English, but with a Palestinian director, um, was perhaps in some ways, I was thinking back through it, maybe one of the most overtly, explicitly political in the way that it was presenting its production. I'll go through these quite quickly, but obviously if anyone's interested in you particularly, you can come back. I think the use of music is no doubt very significant, something Eleanor's already been talking about, but music as a way of framing dramatic moments, of communicating them to people like me who either, who, have, who are not fluent in any other language, might have words and things like that, but are not there as a native speaker or even as a second or third language speaker. Um, but you know, productions like the, uh, the Mexican Henry IV Part I in the top here, and the British Sign Language Love's Labour's Lost, perhaps interestingly as well, made very great use of music. Um, I think to, to frame certain moments and to guide perhaps people like me through who don't necessarily understand the content of all the lines, but to create a sense of mood alongside what we might recognize in terms of plot. I was also interested in the fact there was recorded music at the Globe, which Tom Bird uh, said was the first time that had happened. He also said they weren't going to do it again, but we'll see. Um, but I actually don't know this for sure, but I'm, I would be pretty sure that the, the Measure for Measure, the Russian Measure for Measure, had recorded music. If not, I watched that one actually via um, the space online, so that's a slightly different experience for me. Um, but I think Tom also said that the As You Like It did, so thinking about what recorded versus live does. Um, and the Much Ado About Nothing that was an English language pr performance production, um, but that certainly made use of uh, music and dance to structure some of its scenes. 
And the last thing I wanted to say was just a little bit about physicality, um, which again I think is probably something of a cliche, but I think it is true that alongside music, which we sometimes describe perhaps feebly as an international language, I think physicality also, and in some cases dance that went with that music, in other cases playing, clowning, physical humor that maybe wasn't accompanied by music could be really significant. So there's the Korean Midsummer Night's Dream at the Globe, but also the um, uh, gosh, it's Midsummer Night's Dream as you like it, which is basically the mechanicals um, from Russia down at the bottom here um, that had all kinds of acrobatics in it. And I thought I didn't see a storm, which was a Welsh language production, but I thought I would put it in there because it was one of I think one of the lesser um, known. Some of these productions, the ones that featured at the Globe and the ones that featured at the RSC, I think kind of get mapped into the festival, but other ones sometimes find themselves on the fringes. Um, and the reviewer for a storm really emphasized the physicality of that production as well, which came to, through to him as very significant, even though he was a Welsh language speaker himself. So what I'd like to finish with are just a few reflections on the digital part of my title, which is where my own research interests actually are really going. Um, I'm really interested in broadcasting in general and how broadcasting works in the sense of creating festivity and perhaps also comedy or some kind of communality around comedy. Um, so I didn't mention Shakespeare on Locks, but this was a BBC part of the Olympics as well that also featured Shakespeare, well, this portion especially featured Shakespeare very heavily. Um, and in some ways, I mean, there's lots of different elements that were part of this, but the most well-known elements was the Hollow Crown series. Um, not officially comedy, but I wanted to pick up on it for a few reasons. Um, one is because it's interesting to me the kind of, again, if I'm thinking from my, with my legacy hat on, the legacy it has had, um, not least in the fact that they're going to do another four of those, um, despite the fact that there was some grumbling about its ratings at the time of viewing. Um, but also because there's been quite a strong fan response, especially online. So this is the Hollow Crown fans group, um, who currently are just under 9,000 people strong, which is far greater than the following of the Shakespeare Institute, which I run. So I don't think 9,000 people uh, should be sniffed at, but of course it's far smaller than any celebrity. So all of these things work in terms of scale, as do the finances of these kinds of things. Um, but it's been really interesting for me following them, seeing the kinds of memes they share, the kinds of uh, Shakespeare-related news, and also Shakespeare Sunday, which is a kind of quote sharing that they do every week around a certain theme. Um, and it's also, it certainly hasn't directly led to other projects, but I think we've seen the emergence, continued emergence of digital projects a year later, the summer of 2013, we had the RSC doing A Midsummer Night's Dreaming, um, which is this, this is the quote unquote stage here. It was a collaboration between the RSC and Google Plus. Um, and um, it was critiqued for a lot of different reasons, not least because there was a, a ton of content and perhaps not a, a great, a, a limited sense of cohesion, um, depending on how you engaged with it. It involved on-site live performances that were limited uh, to kind of invited members of the public, but then also a huge outpouring of online discussion and performance. Um, this was the main stage, which I won't go into much, but it included kind of Robin Goodfellow as our sort of host and compare, but then set the court fairies and it goes on with the lovers and it has everyone's family member, like Bottom's wife and um, you know, someone else's mom, and all, you know, the, the slugs in the forest, everyone has a voice, so it's kind of about amplifying the voices in this place. Um, and it included a kind of, maybe we want to call it a backstage, or a preview, or an audience stage, um, which was this, and this is one of the issues with the project, was knowing which stage we should be looking at. But this was actually the Google Plus sort of forum in which well before the actual performance around midsummer last year, um, there were, there, the RSC was actively trying to generate audience kind of discussion and maybe we would also say kind of participation and self-performance in the project. So doing things like sharing memes um, that, had, that use lines from a Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, there was one kind of a few days where people were posting songs to put on a playlist for bottoms so of things like Otis Redding's Dreams to Remember. Um, and other things along those lines. And I just have a, a slide here of a few things I pulled off of that site, some of which were audience generated and some of which were actually part of the creative plans for the project um, in terms of the new content they were creating. You can always come back to this. I should say that it was some of the, the festival part of it was wedding themed. If you're wondering why there's a terrier with a hat on, I think that's why. Um, so one thing that really interests me um, is the fact that this was an international online project 
Um, and also the, the language was, I think, pretty resolutely English. And I think that could be the same for the hollow crowned fans. And to some, in some ways, perhaps that makes sense. This in particular is an RSC project. Um, they, for this particular project, expressed a specific commitment to, to Shakespeare's language, having been critiqued very heavily for a previous online project, such as Tweet Sorrow, where they still use English, but in some ways modernized or changed Shakespeare's language. Um, but I think it's also something worth considering just in terms of where things are going online, how obviously online uh, platforms make different kinds of culture more available. So in some ways that means a diversity of cultural products. But I also sometimes am interested to wonder the extent to which it also means that certain kinds perhaps become more dominant. Um, so I'm going to finish just with a few slides along those lines. I'm not going to say too much so that we don't get behind schedule. But I, I was thinking about this, obviously with A Midsummer Night's Dream, you know, it seems like it's a comedy, so it makes sense that funny memes would maybe be produced by it. But I was also struck when I was, this is a blog that I started uh, about, I don't know, nine months ago. I was writing something about Coriolanus and at the Dunmar and about the, the virtual transmission or the cinematic transmission. And in looking for images, I found lots of memes for this as well, perhaps unsurprisingly because it's Tom Hiddleston. Um, but here's a few examples of them which I also struck me is that they are, in their own way, resolutely humorous, um, coming out of a play that isn't necessarily a comedy. I especially, if anyone saw the play, either in person or through the cinema, you'll recognize this moment here in the bottom uh, right, which is uh, after the battle. Um, and I like it in Lego, I think it's funny. But this, this thing of the, the internet, at least as I'm currently working through it, I'm wondering, I think the internet does humor very well, um, but I'm wondering, what the limits of that are, or where that goes, or if it does other genres or other modes, we might call them, too. Um, and this is something that came up a little bit at a conference in Paris that I know some of you all were at in a plenary by Sarah Hetchel, where she was talking about the fragmentation, the, the, the persistence, but also fragmentation of Shakespeare's 90s film in the digital realm. And she showed us a clip, this is a, something I wrote about it, she showed us a clip called Hamlet Gone Viral, which was a high school English student's um, kind of senior project, which I thought was really witty. It used the language of uh, the internet and specifically social media to tell the story of Hamlet, so things like this here um, or this here. And it was, it was notable how much laughter there was around it, myself included. And it was something that came up in the comments as well about how funny it was and also how by and large, the example she had given of this kind of phenomenon of the digital translation of film was a funny, uh, it resulted in humorous products. Um, and I think in some ways that might be reminiscent from things that we maybe have seen um, you know, in the past years, like the Hamlet Facebook Newsfeed edition, which was published in McSweeney's uh, Internet Tendency. I don't know if people know that, um, but it's Dave Eggers' project. Um, which also, very, you know, it kind of parody. It, I think the internet is often used as a mode of parody or as a subject of parody. Um, so I guess what I want to kind of conclude with is thinking that in some ways I think that digital Shakespeare works well as a comedy, um, and also that it tends to favor English, and maybe that is simply because that's just what I'm seeing, and that there's lots of other stuff out there that is multilingual, um, and it'll be interesting to see if they come together. I know, for instance, it's hard sometimes to track usage if you're not in charge of the site, but I know from working with the RSC that was a Midsummer Night Streaming, although the majority of their audience was from the UK and the US, they did have a significant European contingent, and looking through it, I don't think I saw any non-English in there, so that's just something maybe to think about. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say is that um, I think that, that that element of global Shakespeare is interesting to me. The kind of global Shakespeare that's global in the sense of reaching global audiences all, often through the way it's broadcast, perhaps through the way that it's funded, through the people who are in it, um, but that perhaps is also um, not global in the way that we, someone like me who is a kind of novice in this field might expect it to be, translation into other languages or into other forms. And I just, the last image I have is this little bit here, which is of the Global Shakespeare's uh, multimedia online database performance, which is amazing. Um, it has all different kinds of things, and I sometimes forget that these kinds of things in here, like clips from Much Ado About Nothing, The King's Speech, uh, Coriolanus, the feature films, are also part of that global mix. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.